Welcome into the August 16th episode of the Locked On At Least podcast. I'm Mike DiStefano with Dave Morasuti. We're hosts here on Locked On Leafs. Jacob Chikorin has been in the rumor mill, Dave. Should the Maple Leafs enter the chat here? We'll debate that today. We'll get into a little bit of some World Junior Championship talk. And there's a very interesting giveaway happening for the Vegas Golden Knights. I can't wait to share with you folks what that is because it might be the stupidest thing I have ever seen. We'll chat about that in a little bit. That and more on today's edition of Locked on Leafs. Your Locked on Maple Leafs, your daily podcast on the Toronto Maple Leafs. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Leafs podcast, your one-stop shop for all things Leafs. I'm your host, Mike DiStefano from TSN 1050 Toronto Radio, also known as Al's brother on TSN's Overdrive and TSN 1050's Leafs Lunch. Joining me, it's my co-host, Dave Morissuti from Sportsnet, also writer for the NHLPA. Locked On Leafs is a daily Maple Leafs-centric podcast, so be sure to subscribe for free. Wherever you get your podcasts from, you can also now catch us up on video format on YouTube. Just head up Locked On Leafs on YouTube, hit subscribe and uh, share us with uh, everyone you know. Let's try and grow the community here on Locked On Leafs. You can also go check out our Discord, which has been popping off over the course of the World Junior Championships. Um, so get in on all the action there with our Locked On Leafs Discord channel. A um, lot of stuff to get into today. We'll we'll talk a little bit about the World Junior Championships. Uh, there's a very, very weird giveaway that the Vegas Golden Knights are doing. And then Jacob Chikrin uh, apparently is in the rumor mill. I know the Ottawa Senators had some interest. And I'm curious, Dave, if we should maybe talk about the Leafs and whether or not they should be entering the chat in these sweepstakes. Yes. Uh, it's, it, it, we First off, we need to generate some generate some interesting content given the summer and everything. So thank you, Brent Wallace, for pointed out we'll we'll dive into a little bit more about that but first mike we cannot start the show without you sharing some great news about what you did for the first time (laughs) because i was i so you called me about it so you gave me the heads up about it i don't think a lot of people were expecting to hear the news that you shared which it's pretty big news yeah, uh, so I guess for those who, who didn't watch uh, yesterday, I guess we're considering it'll be yesterday by the time this gets out there, uh, I co-hosted Overdrive for the first time ever. I've been on the show a lot, right? I've been on the show, done my guest appearances and whatnot, and a lot of the listeners from this podcast know who I am from Overdrive. Appreciate you keeping along with my work and, and being fans of me and even carrying off the, the TSM platform. So thank you to those who uh, are, are Al's Brothers fans and have carried on uh, to here to the Locked On Network. But uh, today, for the first time, I get to sit in the chair and co-host the entire three hours, 4 to 7 p.m., under the bright lights, put a suit on and everything. Dave, I was sweltering in that. The first 10 minutes were tough to get through because I was just dying. A, the lights. B, a little bit of pregame jitters, you know, a little bit of anxiousness. And I was just beaming the first little bit, I swear to you, man, it was, I was a little worried about how the show was going to go. Cause if I would have kept sweating like that, I would have sweat through my suit within probably the first hour, but ended up kind of, you know, settling down a little bit. Once we got into the groove of things, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Hopefully uh, for those who watched it, enjoyed the show, uh, but it's definitely like a big, like that's a bucket list item. I mean, that's not even something that I dreamed of, to be quite honest with you. I mean, Overdrive is the number one show in the country. And That's right. never in a million years when you and I were both uh, school chums at Centennial College, I think that, you know, five years later, I was going to be co-hosting the show on national television. I just simply didn't think that was even in the cards. And, you know, hey, man, hard work, pull, you know, pulls, uh, hard work pays off. So, you know, yes. follow your dreams, kids. Follow your dreams. Exactly. And like, first off, I I am like summertime. I am pro trying to wear the bare minimum when it comes to I ain't wearing a suit. <laughs> like I am like when I saw you in the suit, I'm just like, boy, oh. I was sweating watching you at first. Yeah, that's what AK said. 
He's like, I am sweating just by watching you sweat. I was like, yeah, I had to have the paper towel next to me, and I'm doing a little dab session in between, like in between the the first couple of commercial breaks, just because I'm like, oh god, guys, we are struggling. But yeah, we we ended up kind of getting through. The thing is, like, I did it with Eric Kronick and with Frank Corrado, former Maple Leaf, and they're like, when we found out that we were doing the show together, like, we got to suit up, boys, got to suit up. And I'm like. Oh, God, really? In the middle of the summer, under those hot TV lighting. Uh, but we did it. We got through it. It wasn't as bad as I thought it would be in terms of, you know, the heat and the sweat, sweatometer. Uh, but it was a lot of fun, man. I really did. You have a chance to listen to any of it? I, I listened to actually, I, I was listening. I wasn't watching it first because I was out uh, taking my cousin's dog for a walk. So I was listening to it. And I, and then I saw the, I was, I caught the video later. I'm just, and I'm just like, dude, suits, like it's classy as heck as Italians. We like to you know, got to dress nice. So uh-huh. I'm sure that's, that played a few big, a little bit of a role into that, but I'm just like, oh man, <laughs> like, and here's the thing. What if you've ever, and my, Mike and I have worked in many different situations where it's either blistering hot in the environment we're in, or it's freaking cold. Like oh, there's no in between the warmest place in the, in the world. And yeah. you and I have worked a lot inside hockey rinks. So we have, we definitely have. So it's a, it's a great thing to see you cross one off the bucket list. I was able to do that last year when I got to go to my first great cup working. Nice. Still got a little more in, in that I want to achieve though. And I'm sure you do as well. Oh yeah. I mean, like I've, I've done a lot so far like so early in my career I'm, I'm so thankful for the opportunities that i've been given and luckily i haven't made a fool of myself to the point where they aren't giving me any more opportunities they keep giving me these chances so i'm like all right let's try not to work while uh, while i get these opportunities and you know somehow i'm i'm fooling everybody into thinking i know what i'm talking about apparently but uh no today was a lot of fun and, and absolutely just a, a bucket list thing like i remember legitimately listening to overdrive back when I was an undergrad at Western in like 2015, 2016 and listening to the show while doing homework. And six years later, you know, I'm that guy on the, on the radio and maybe there's somebody listening, doing their homework, listening to me talk. And it's just kind of, I don't know. It's, I, I get a little goosebumps thinking about how I guess far I've come in such short little time in my career, but Hey man, I'm, I'm excited to see where, uh, where my career takes me, I suppose. But definitely today, massive milestone for me and uh, hopefully many many more shows to come with uh, with those boys maybe at some point you know it'd be it'd be even better if it's with the original crew you know like if i'm sitting next to to hayes and noodles or hayes and o-dog and we're doing a show but today was pretty sweet uh pretty sweet too but enough about me why don't we put uh, put that conversation to the side a little bit let's get into some hockey talk and get into some uh leafs chatter Uh, But before we do, Dave, why don't we take a quick break and hear from one of our show sponsors. uh, We'll get back, get into the Jacob Chicken conversation, chat a little World Juniors, and then this weird, weird giveaway that the Vegas Golden Knights are going to be doing in uh, this season. So we'll do all that more when we return. You're listening to Locked On These Podcasts, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Yeah, and today we're bringing in a new, uh, new show sponsor, NHTSA. So, folks, you're hanging out with some friends and putting back a few drinks. A few becomes a few too many as the evening comes to an end and people start to head out. You think of calling for a ride. Nah, you live nearby. You can make it home okay. It's no big deal. What are the odds you get pulled over anyway? Even so, what's the worst that could happen? Your insurance goes up. You lose your license. You lose your job. You total your car. You kill someone. Everyone knows about the risks of drunk driving. Results are tragic and often deadly. However, that still doesn't stop everyone from getting behind the wheel while under the influence. That's why police officers are out there right now and looking for impaired drivers on our roads to save lives. So think you're okay to drive after a few drinks. Think again. Play safe and plan ahead to get a ride. It only takes one mistake to change your life or someone else's forever. Drive sober. Or get pulled over. Welcome back into the Locked On Leafs podcast. I'm Mike DiStefano with Dave Morissuti. We're hosts here at Locked On Leafs. Um, so, 
Jacob Chikrin, talented defenseman for the Arizona Coyotes. This is a pretty cheap deal, but uh, the Yotes are are in a you know they're in a rebuild. They're looking to get as much uh, assets as they can for their star players. And Chikrin, arguably the best player that they have on that team, that could garner them the highest amount of uh, of assets if they're looking to mine other teams to pry Chikrin off their hands. And uh, we, we did get a report from Brett Wallace of uh, the Wally Mathot Show, formerly of TSN, who covered the Senators, still covers the Senators, um, that the Ottawa Sen still trying to land Jacob Chikrin. And apparently the asking price is two first-round picks and a high-end prospect, but they're willing to take salary back. And, and uh, Nikita Zaitsev, who we all know very, very well here in Toronto. Nikita Zaitsev would be going back as well as a bit of a cap dump. Um, so they're willing to take on some salary. So if you're Toronto and you know this is what uh, the package is, or at least what the ask is, if you're Toronto, if you're Kyle Dubas, are you getting on the horn here? Like, does this interest you at all? Should you be trying to get in on the sweepstakes here for Jacob Chikrin? Or what? Like, what are you thinking about this uh, this news and this new piece of information, Dave? Well, I think you have to first decide whether or not Chikrin is the right fit for the Leafs, right? I know he's a left shot defenseman, but he has also played his offside. And he's played it quite often. Um, so there's that thing to consider. What I like about Chikrin and I think the reason why the conversation is really starting to come out now is because, and we've talked about this many times, is his contract, right? You, there's, you're not going to get a top four defenseman making what he is making at the age that he is as well for the next three seasons. I believe that's how much he has left on his deal. Like you, when you're when you're the Arizona Coyotes, mm-hmm. and like they they obviously realize their window isn't going to be for quite a while, right? So here you have a you know. A guy who has a very desirable, you know, age, 24, making 4.6 over the next three seasons. For me, that's a very attractive thing for the Leafs because here's the thing. They they definitely could use a guy, use some help on the right side. I understand he's a left shot. So some people are always hesitant to play the left shot, you know, a guy who shoots left on the right. But it's worked with TJ Brody. I think Jacob Chikorin's skill set actually work a lot better in that he can play that right side. He's very mobile. He does a lot of those things. The question here becomes, okay, if I'm the Leafs, two first-round picks, sure, that is tough because the Leafs have constantly traded first-round picks, or in this case, moved back in this draft. So you, you always think, oh, we keep giving up first-round picks. But here's my th- my thing about that. Would the first round picks that you are picking guarantee or get you somewhere close to what Jacob Chikorin is now and could very well be? I just don't know. Like, I, like that you're taking a bigger gamble of keeping those picks rather than going to get the guy who's a for sure thing and you have him for three seasons. I think that's something that doesn't get talked about enough when it comes to Chikorin. Great player playing for a not so great team and a team that seems to want to move them but is also trying to maximize on the return. I get that that's a high price, but it's a price that I would be willing to pay if you can also offload a contract or two on top of that. Yeah, and, and I think like you hit the nail on the head when you say, like, look, there's three years left to control on Jacob Chikrin here at a fairly reasonable cap hit at $4.6 million. I mean, this is a guy who you can bring in to your top four and he can play your left, he can play your right side, however you, you, know, you need to kind of shape out your lineup. And he can be a very effective defenseman. This past season uh, didn't quite have the numbers he did have the year before. But, I mean, that team was just god-awful. So I, I, I don't really blame him. I think that he's a very talented defenseman and could certainly help the Maple Leafs here. And with that three-year window that you're talking about, like, you need – you need to win now if you're Toronto. Like this next three years, that's your window. Two years really is kind of your window until you got to kind of reset the market with Austin Matthews' new contract. Should he want to come back to Toronto? And they've also got to deal with Willie Nylander the following year. You got Mitch Marner, so you're gonna have you know in the next two three years. This is about where the team's gonna need to get that victory, need to get that Stanley Cup before things get a little bit dicey uh, with the direction of this of this club. The question is, like, 
if we look at it, they're looking to get two first round picks, a top end prospect, and then they're they're asking uh, or they're taking on salary from Ottawa in Nikita Zaitsev. Now, they're asking for two first round picks. Clearly, Ottawa has yet to soften on on what they're willing to give up. I don't think they are willing to give up two first round picks which might be the reason why we have not seen this deal go through yet. Maybe they're like, well, we'll give you a high-end prospect and one first-round pick, but a second one, I don't know if we're willing to do that. But if you are Toronto, you got to think that your first-rounders will be much lower than Ottawa's, so you're going to have to give up two if that's the case. And what I'm thinking is if I'm giving up two first-round picks – the package that I would want to, or the the contract that I would want to go back, would it be Justin Hall? Would it be Alex Kerfoot? I think it would have to be Jake Muzzin. And that's where it gets difficult because I know he does have technically a no-trade clause. So if you don't want to go to Arizona, which I guarantee you don't want to go, uh, that'll be very difficult to to make that happen. So I don't even know if that would be possible Uh, to make that happen, but that would be the best case scenario for Toronto. Uh, If not, I suppose Kerfoot and Hall to make the salary work because you're bringing in $4.6 million. You're already over the salary cap. So you kind of do need to move on from a couple of contracts if you're bringing in 4.6 million bucks. So I'm thinking the equivalent to what they're asking from Ottawa would be, let's say Muzzin's not in the cards. Like I wish he could be, but he's not going to go play at Arizona state. He's just not going to play for 5,000 people. Just not going to happen at his, at his point. So probably you're looking at a Kerfoot, a Justin Hall, two first round picks. And then you're looking at uh, a top end prospect. Well, Rasmus Sandin hasn't signed a contract yet. That could be the replacement for Jacob Chikrin in Fien- or in uh, Arizona. So if that is the ask from the Arizona Coyotes, Kerfoot, Hall, two first and Rasmus Sandin, you pull the trigger. I think it's a little much, in my opinion. Like, I know you have to make the salaries work, but I still think Kerfoot's a decent player. Like, and I don't know if that, and I don't know if he would actually waive his uh, his no trade clause to go to, I think yeah. this is uh, like modified that well, he has modified, to submit. But... He submits 10 teams and he might just say, I'm putting Arizona on that team. So he'll just nix all that. Like, I understand the reason why we're including both of them is because you have to get the salaries to work. Plus, the Leafs are already over the cap, so it's, you know, they can't just be bringing in salary too. Yeah. Because if you're doing all that, plus you're adding two first-round picks and you're adding a prospect, I think you either have to tell Arizona um, the pick ha- picks have to change in some way or we're not giving you a you know, really high-end prospect. And they, Look, they might say, well, and we're just going to hold on to Jacob Chikrin. That's totally fine. But we already know that in three years, he is most likely leaving. The clock is ticking for Arizona. And you don't want to have to sit here now and say, we could have gotten some decent assets now. Now, the Leafs' assets probably aren't going to be as good as what you mentioned with Ottawa and what their picks could be. But Arizona also has to think about, they're going to have all these picks, but they got to eventually have some capable NHL buys. I know that they're like at some point, I know they're probably likely going to be them in Chicago are going to be like all in on the Connor Bedard, you know, tank Not for him to be all in. On. We'll talk about him in a moment, but, but continue. You got to have some semblance of an NHL team when he is, when you bring these guys into the fold. Yeah. Yeah. Nick Ritchie, hmm. buddy, Nick Ritchie, top six, four, oh, sorry, the Arizona yeah. Coyotes. Forgot about that. Yeah, Tyler Boyd. They just got a bunch of Leafs cast-offs, apparently, in their top six. That's what it's all about. Like, uh, they just, they, they're such a uh, – like, the team is such – like, I can't get what the Arizona Coyotes are right now. Oh, they like, just want to suck. Like, it's pretty yeah, obvious that they're – I call paying. them the NHL graveyard. It's where guys go – like, teams that don't want players, send them to Arizona. And, like, Arizona has some decent young talent, but they're sandwiched into – absolute tire fire of pl- I can't even call it talent around them because it's not really talent because the teams yeah. are just like, okay, can you take Shane Goss spare off our hands? Cause he's absolutely dreadful. Sure. Why not? Like what? 
at yeah. some point you have you have like Zach, but... Zach Cassie might be a top six forward for them this season. He but... probably will be. He probably will be a top six forward, top nine for for sure. So if you're not willing to meet that price, like what's what's the offer that you're you're calling up Arizona and you're saying, look, we want Chikrin. This is what we're willing to offer you. What is that price? What's that package look like? <sighs> Like if you're gonna, because we have to figure the salaries out. If Jake Muzzin says no, thing is, if Kerfoot says no, I'm just looking at the Leafs. They're like, who else, salary wise, can they move There's off? Really, nobody else, unless you're getting into the Nylander territory. Like at, at that point, you're like, okay, we'll move Justin Hall, and then we'll move Kerfoot in a separate deal. Like that's the way that you would get around it. Like it's not difficult. I mean. Make yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Cool, but that's what you would have to do if you were to nix it. But it's like, hey, Kerf, you can go be a top six player in a contract year, put up a bunch of points in Arizona, being on the top power play unit, being there, and that could give you an opportunity to cash in next year when you hit unrestricted free agency. Like, there's a little bit of a carrot there because he'll have a much larger offensive role uh, or role in general with Arizona than he would have with the Maple Leafs. I like your idea a little bit more of, okay, move Justin Hall. You can do the two first round picks and a prospect and then move Kerfoot in a separate deal because I guarantee there are teams that would want an Alexander Kerfoot. So that's, that's kind of where Kerfoot going to get you. Like, honestly, I don't think so. If you're were like, you're still willing to give up two first round picks on top of that. So Kerfoot's your hangup. Oliver Bjorkstrand, who's a 30 goal scorer in the league. Like I think he'll score 30 goals. and He's a pretty solid two way player. He went for a third and a fourth round pick last month. Third and a fourth round pick. What's Kerfoot going to get you? Maybe a third. But I mean, the, we're not expecting. Value is high. So, so if you're still willing to give up those two first, I mean, I would just make that trade if if that would work. Kerfoot, Hall, two first, and Sandine. If if that's what you're willing to give up anyway. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I'm just saying that if let's say Kerfoot says no to Arizona. Then I said, okay, then we're gonna have to figure out a, like a separate situation to make that work, because I think like Kerfoot would then have to definitely go if you're adding Chicken salary, which would then bump like really in, increase the need to move off salary because the Leafs are one point four over. Yes, they're gonna likely send down a few bodies with the waivers as well because they do have like fourteen forwards right now. Um, that's all I'm saying. Like, if Kerfoot is in the deal and willing to be moved to Arizona, fine by me because you're gonna have to make the salary. You're gonna have to get under the cap anyways. We already know that this these decisions are coming, and you're trying. You have to find ways to improve the blue line. They didn't do anything to the blue line. It's the same as last year. So you get a chance to get a significant upgrade in Jacob Chicken. You got to think about it, but. This is maybe where Kyle Dubas is thinking the cap uh, gymnastics might be a little bit too much for the Leafs to try to figure out. So, I mean, realistically, to be quite honest with you, I was playing devil's advocate the whole time, just, you mm-hmm. know, playing the opposite role, but I wouldn't make that deal. It's a lot, though. Like, when you really think about it, like, well, two first also, up- I mean, like, that's, that's, that's what I would probably give up for, like, a first pair defenseman two first in the top end prospect. Like that's what I'd be giving up for a first pair. And I mean, Sandine is he a top end prospect now at this point in his career? Maybe not, you know, maybe you consider him like a B plus as opposed to an A level prospect, but you know, two first round picks, that's, that's a, that is heavy, heavy value that you're giving up there. So, and for a guy who uh, really only had one terrific season, I don't know if I'd be willing to roll the dice and, and hope that he rebounds and becomes you know, that all-star defenseman again uh, here in Toronto. Uh, plus, you want really another lefty? Like, that, 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 like, that's another issue, too. I mean, yeah, he can play the right side, but you already have two other guys on the right side who you're probably going to have being left-handed. You're going to really go into a season with, like, five, maybe even, like, or at least five, I guess, of your defenseman being left-handed? I, I don't – I just – that's a lot. That, that's asking a lot in terms of the balance, definitely for sure. Like, I, I would. Think- I'm giving you one first round pick, take on Kerfoot's deal, and like essentially one first Sandine, and then take on Kerfoot's money. 
and Hall, I guess, if you want to try and make the money work. Like that's that's where I'm comfortable. One first, take mm-hmm. away, strip away a first from that ask. That's where I'd be like, okay, Dubis, I that's my I think that's worth it. And that's only because it doesn't sound like Sandine wants to come back to Toronto. So you might as well use him as a trade piece. And I think even he's devalued his value uh, a little bit here over the course of the summer. And plus, when you think about like the set, what the Senator's potential deal is, Nikita Zaitsev is bottom of, the, we, bottom of the barrel in terms of what you get back in return when you consider Justin Hall. I'd rather have Justin Hall over Nikita Zaitsev. And yeah, what's of contract looking like too? Like how many more years are on that thing? He has two more years left at four point five. Okay, so if there's only two more years, I guess it's not the worst thing in the world. Yeah, he's got this year and next. He also has a modified no trade clause though, so you could <laughs> you could nix that. Well, that's the, that's something I talked about on Locked On NHL with uh, Ross Levitin, and like Zeiss has got to say yes to it, or at least we mentioned that he has to say yes to it. But I mean. No tax state in Arizona, a little bit. He might have preferred that over playing in yeah, Ottawa. Yeah, go back to the West Coast, and yeah, potentially. Yeah, just, All right. Just uh, yeah. Uh, well, we'll see. I mean, like this is all very hypothetical. It just sounds right. like the trade winds are starting to pick back up with with Jacob Chikrin, and I wondered, you know, what what if the Maple Leafs were to make a move? What would you be comfortable giving up? Would you get into the race there? And if that's the ask is to first top prospect um, and willing to take on salary, that second first round pick for me makes me hang up the phone if I'm Kyle Dubas. But we'll see. We'll see. That's the ask. Doesn't mean that's what it'll take. That's just the ask. All right. Uh, on the other side, we'll get into some World Jeer talk and also uh, tell you all about that bizarre, bizarre giveaway that the Vegas Golden Knights are doing uh, this season. But before we get into all of that, let me tell you about BetOnline.net. It's the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your betting needs. Find all your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. Find reviews and news for every league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, golf, and even the World Junior Championships. Bet online continues to be the top online resource for all your sports wagering information from live in game betting, scores, podcasts. They got you covered. Head to Bet Online today and use your mobile device to learn more about the action happening. Bet Online, it's where the game starts. Welcome back into the Locked On NHL podcast, uh, Locked On Leafs podcast, rather, Locked On Leafs. You are on the Locked On NHL podcast, which you can go find on the Locked On NHL. Uh, Network's YouTube page, also the uh, the audio wherever you get your podcast from. But this is Locked On Leafs, uh, a daily podcast for the crazy Maple Leaf fans, Leafs Nation. It's a podcast for y'all. Hopefully, you enjoyed the conversation you're hearing today. If you have, go ahead, smash that uh, smash that thumbs uh, thumbs up button if you're watching on YouTube, and hopefully you've subscribed as well for daily content coming your way. And it'll be daily again coming up. Uh, and in just a few weeks, as training camp around the corner, less than a month till training camps kind of kick off for rookie camps at the very least. So, summer's uh, summer's going quick, and it's going a lot quicker too. Now that there's also World Junior Championships kind of infiltrating our our summer schedules here, it's almost as if it's it's a, a prelim to the preseason. Get a little bit of early hockey here in mid August. Um, Canada ended up undefeated through there. Um, preliminary rounds, a big 6-3 win over Finland the other night. And let me tell you what's going on. First of all, Mason McTavish is an absolute animal. Like This guy's a phenom out there right now. A man amongst boys. He's clearly, clearly done with junior hockey. This guy's going to be in the NHL this season for the Anaheim Ducks. Um, So for those who kind of have followed this channel for a while, uh, I'm a big hockey card buff. I like to to collect hockey cards and whatnot. And when Mason McTavish, when the tournament started, his hockey card day was going for roughly twenty to twenty five bucks ish. Today, that card is going for sixty dollars. It's nearly tripled over the course of the tournament because of the performance that this kid has put on over the course of the last ten days. That's pretty. That's pretty like. That's pretty incredible for a guy who hasn't even reached the NHL yet, right? And like you would think that 
you know, guys like Connor Bedard, you know, those who went, who are like touted as top end prospects, their cards would be worth a lot more yeah. now. But to be fair, most of the kids in this tournament don't have yeah. Young Guns rookie cards because they haven't played in the NHL yet. Whereas McTavish has one because he did play, what, seven or eight games in the NHL for the Ducks at the mm-hmm. beginning of the season. So because of those games played, he was eligible for a rookie card. So to be fair, none of these other kids really have like an official rookie card. Yeah. And like, I know, I mean, based on my experience with the NHLPA, like these guys don't get their rookie cards until they're invited really to the NHLPA's rookie showcase where they get their first rookie card as well. So, um, yeah, a lot of these guys haven't, haven't had that opportunity yet. And it's going to be weird. Cause like Mason McTavish is really one of the few guys that has that NHL experience at the tournament. Cause a lot of the other guys are just like, uh, we're going to focus on the NHL season. And he's like, and he's like, I'm going to go and try to rip up this tournament and win Canada gold medal, which He's got them. He's got them in in a pretty decent spot right now. Seven goals in the last three games out of this guy um, leads the entire league in goals, points, second in assists as well. So he's just ridiculous, doing unbelievable things. And it's alongside Connor Bedard, who is like to me at this point. I think it's it's safe to say that he's probably the best prospect prospect that the NHL has seen since Connor McDavid. Like I, I, you can argue based on how it's gone for Austin Matthews, but I don't recall Austin Matthews being touted as generational. Like he was going to be a, a, an elite top line center and a good goal scorer, but I don't really recall him having the, you know, the next one, the generational talent, mm-hmm. you know, attached to his name. He wasn't in the same breath as the Crosby and the McDavid's. And I think part of that could be because he's American and he wasn't a an exceptional status player like we saw happen with McDavid. And, you know, a guy, a kid who we've known since he was 12 years old, Connor Bedard's that kid. So we were watching him as a kid for the last four years. And then seeing what he's doing, though, in, uh, in this tournament as a 17-year-old, it's a tournament that uh, Craig Button once told me, former NHL general manager, current analyst with TSN, once told me this is a tournament for 19 and 20-year-olds. For a 17-year-old, freshly 17 years old, to be tearing up this tournament and dominating it in the fashion that he is, I think is a testament to actually how unbelievable this guy is. And when he was a 16-year-old last year, before the tournament got cut short, he had a four-goal game. But the funny part about Carl Bertard is, last year, he was kind of the secondary player. Like he started out as a 13th forward, kind of worked his way up and ended up getting, you know, proving himself and getting earning more ice time. Fast forward to the summer. He's the number one like source of uh, like they're funneling pucks to Bedard. Like he yeah. is the offense goes through Connor Bedard. And as a 17 year old in a tournament that's supposed to be dominated by 20 year olds and 19 year olds has had the 17 year old dominating it is just outstanding. It's absolutely amazing to see. And uh, this kid's going to be real, real good, man. Yeah. Like I'm, he, what, if you hadn't even watched them, like in the world juniors, if you watched them in the WHL, you're not surprised what you're seeing. Like he was, he's do, he was creating scoring records in the WHL. He's one of the 50, first 51 goals scored 51 goals and had a hundred points in like 60, 62 64 games i think it was like it was unbelievable i think he was the first 16 year old to ever score 50 yeah. plus goals in the whl which is ridiculous and like it, junior it, hockey actually across the a, scene. Lot of, a lot of teams aren't putting a 16 year old well i mean first off not many 16 year olds are making it that far anyways like to where he is but he's what he's doing in the whl like we haven't really seen in a, in a while Right, like you, you see some WHL guys who go first overall. They don't have, I think, the hype that Connor Bedard has right now. Like he is probably he could go down as one of the better WHL players of all time in terms of it, how it all plays out near the end. Because put up like Tavares esque numbers in the dub. Like Tavares leads. I'm pretty sure he leads. He has the record for most points in the OHL, goals and points mm-hmm. in the Ontario Hockey League. 
there's a good chance Bedard could do that in the Western League. And that's incredible because the Western Hockey League is tough, especially offensively. It is a tough league to put up points. So I, I give him a lot of credit for being able to do that for sure. Yeah. Um, quickly before we go, I should touch on Matthew Nyes, who uh, is the Maple Leafs' top prospect um, playing at the games. Um, hasn't scored a goal yet, but seems to be getting better and better each game. Wouldn't you say, Dave? Yeah. No, I like – I understand that, and and other people who like to troll these fans. First off, don't listen to those people. They're just trying to get under your skin. They're pointing out oh, he hasn't scored a goal yet. But if you watch him, actually watch him play, and not watch a stat sheet, he is showing that there he's doing the little things you need to do to be a you know a complete player. A can in especially in these sort of tournaments where. Every game matters. He's throwing big hits. He's going to the front and that and that. He's making life easier for his teammates as well. That's exactly the type of... And now you can see why the Leafs were really trying to convince him to sign and join them at the end of last season. Yep. Impactful. He's He's been very impactful despite not getting on the goal sheet. Um you know, he's got a couple of assists so far. I think he had one taken away over the weekend, too. Yes, Should have had did. another one, but unfortunately, uh, not the case. So, uh, yeah, the, the, the stat sheet, he's not filling it in the way that maybe we had thought or hoped he would. But he definitely, if you're watching the games, he looks about as good as we thought he should be. And especially, you know, his, his last game was his best game, in my opinion. Um, their win over Sweden, so... Uh, good to see Matthew Nyes uh, living up to expectations. They'll take on uh, Czechia. That'll be tonight at 10.30. You can watch that on TSN. And Canada playing Switzerland tonight at 7 p.m. Also uh, can be watched on TSN. Germany, Finland will be the first game of the day at noon. Lapia, Sweden at 3.30. Uh, all right, really quickly, Dave, you got to bring up this tweet. Um, the Vegas Golden Knights have been teasing this kind of throughout the entire show. The Vegas Golden Knights put out this tweet, and if you're watching it on YouTube, you can see it right now. Uh, they said, we're using this scenic opportunities of the Vegas road trip to announce our special preseason giveaways. Fans at our preseason home game on September 26th against LA will receive a Bruce Cassidy miniature gold statue. Yes, you heard that correctly. The Vegas Golden Knights are giving away a Bruce Cassidy miniature gold statue. It's like a bust that they have at the NFL at, in, in Canton, like a Canton-style bust, a gold statue with Bruce Cassidy, who, I'll remind you, has not coached a single game for the Vegas Golden Knights at all. They just hired him. And I'll also tell you something. Based on some conversations that I've had with people around the league, it didn't go well in Boston because he's not a, you know, they didn't really appreciate his style, we'll say. Didn't appreciate his tone sometimes. The fact that they're doing a giveaway, they're giving away a gold statue, a miniature gold statue of their head coach, brand new head coach, not not their captain, not Mark Stone, not Alex Petrangelo, you know, not, Jack Eichel. Or, not even, you know, who's been there forever. Jonathan Marcheseau, who's been with the team the entire time. Their brand new head coach who hasn't coached a single game, a single game for the organization. They're like, we're going to give away. Fans would love this. A gold statue of the coach. They're going to love it. This is the stupidest. Just the dumbest thing I think I've ever seen. Classic Vegas move. Well, we know how Mike also feels about statues. If you have exactly, <laughs> and this, right now, now here, you start moving the gold post. You get a statue. You get a statue. Bruce Cassidy, we're going to give you a miniature gold statue. Absolutely. Why? Because you agreed to come here. That's the standards of getting a statue now. Agreeing to coach your team, you get a statue. Being a little, you know, facetious, I get it, but it's just ridiculous, Dave. I, ridiculous. I'm fully on board. I, I'm totally on your side on this. It's. Vegas doesn't have the greatest track record when it comes to coaches, by the way. No, they hate their coaches. They fire right. them after, you know, any, any 
signs of weakness, any signs that this team could be going, you know, south or any struggles. Like, got to get rid of him. Got to get a new guy in here. Got to get a new voice. He'll turn the ship around. I mean, just saying, just saying. The guy they had there first, Gerard Gallant, took them farther than they ever went. And this is now going to be their second coach, third coach. They've been around the league for like five years. They're already on their third coach. And this is the team that's made the playoffs four times. It's just ridiculous how they treat their coaches. And now all of a sudden they're like, hey, 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 hey. You might get fired in, you know, six months if you lose six games in a row. But remember, we gave you a golden statue. Remember that. Vegas, man. Just the. You know, remember when they first came to the league and everyone was like getting on them for being kind of the, I wouldn't call them a, like the joke of the NHL. Like they were just, everyone was just like, ah, oh, they got no chance. They can't go far. I think they're taking this a little too far when it comes to people, you know, calling out Vegas as like the non traditional hockey market and all that stuff. Like everything that they did in that first season, even the first few seasons, they've kind of fizzled a little bit of that magic, in my opinion. Because they're oh, like, you know, Gold statues. Yeah. And, and, like, I don't even know if we talked about Robin Leonard, but, like, he's not going to play at all this season. I think we brought it up, like, right. last week. Yeah. And so we don't even know how this season's going to go for them. Because they don't have a gold – real. they don't have a number one goaltender. Like, the Laurent Brassois and, were they, Logan Thompson? Yep. Like, those are the guys who are going to be in net for them. And, oh, I don't, I don't know how I feel about that. It's a lot of unproven – there. People want to talk about the least goaltending situation. Well, yeah, let's talk about Vegas right now. I mean, look, to Not be great. fair, Not the best. had a number one guy. But yeah, they should bring in Louis Domingue. Not the best. Not the best. Definitely. I don't know, man. Like, it, it, it would, it, it'd be one thing if it was, like, Mark Stone, right? Or if it was Jonathan March. So, like, like I said, someone who's been there with the organization and is, like, a fan favorite. But for it to be... Someone who hasn't even coached in a a single game for your organization. It's just so so stupid, so stupid. Anyway, that's uh, that's enough complaining about that. All right, Dave, why don't we uh, kind of leave it there before I say something I don't want to say? Who do you think? Actually, here for the comments section below for those who've made it forty minutes into this podcast, thank you so much for uh, for doing so. And this will be. This will be great. So whoever's made it this far, here's a little test for you. Put it in the comment section down below if you're watching this on YouTube. Would you rather have a gold statue of myself, Mike, or of Dave? If we did a giveaway, we're giving away a gold statue of oh, oh, me or of Dave. I want you to put it down in the comment section below. I know you'll have at least one person who's going to say you. If whoever does say me kudos to you i know the exact person who's gonna say you you should know that person as well <laughs> and it's know. not your mother well it could be your mother's burner i actually am not sure about that but yeah teach my mother how to even get onto youtube is a is a challenge and a half so definitely not her no definitely not her all right buddy good show fun stuff um vegas you're stupid but what are you gonna do all right, that's going to do it for us here today in the podcast. I'd like to thank you all for listening and supporting the show. You can subscribe to the Locked On These Podcasts for uh, all your podcasting needs for daily leaves content. Follow myself on Twitter at Mickey underscore Canuck. Follow Dave at D underscore Morissuti. Go ahead, smash that like button. Uh, please leave a comment down below. And if you're listening on iTunes, leave us a review and a rating. That'd be really appreciated as well. Helps with the algorithms, which is what uh, – you know, the social media stuff's all about nowadays. We'll be back with another episode tomorrow, uh, folks. Uh, but until then, keep it locked right here on Locked On Leafs.